in my recent video about the five names most pharaohs possessed, keen-eyed viewers will have noticed that only two of those names, the throne name and the personal name, were encircled by the shape most of us know as the cartouche. That's a French word, of course. In Egyptian, the shape is called Shenu, and in fact is an elongated form of this hieroglyph, which is conventionally called Shen. The quick and dirty explanation is that the cartouche or Shenu is a protective boundary. It mystically encases the pharaoh's most important names, the name he uses officially and the name he uses personally, and thus protects it from being spoken in vain or being cursed, but there is a bit more to it than that. With any luck, a few minutes worth or this video will be very short. The Shen shows a string or rope coiled up, meeting itself and running on. One of the meanings of the Shen, therefore, is the idea of eternity. And not just eternity, but the idea that each event and person of the present is a loop in the unending string. Things are this way now, but the rope runs on, ever backwards, ever forwards, looped here, knotted there, but extended eternally. Often, where the rope meets itself, you can see bindings depicted. Our brief moment of existence in the cosmic scheme of things is tenuous, and we hold it tight for as long as we can, doing everything in our power to stop the rope from snapping straight and moving on without us, as it invariably must. We see this use in the symbology of a few gods, notably the minor goddess Renpet Nefret, whose purview is the tallying of years marking off each time the loop completes itself. She is a functionary of eternity itself, represented by the god Chach, who personifies both the infinite and the eternal. He shares his name with the primordial ocean, the boundless dark water from which the world emerged in the very beginning. Here, Isis, Egypt's first great magician and queen, kneels upon the hieroglyph for gold, itself a symbol of untarnished eternity, with her hand laid upon Shen. Perhaps she is supported by eternity, perhaps she is kneeling before it, the touch a sign of deference. In this magnificent amulet, Horus grasps two Shen rings, Horus the very spirit of sovereignty. Egypt has eternity in its talons, the pinnacle of creation and beneficiary of so many of eternity's great cycles. But the mighty rope of time is forever moving, and clasp it though we might, we all know that in the end, even Horus will be forced to let go. As well as being a symbol for the infinite, the Shen has another useful function. It's a small sign with an abstract meaning, and makes an excellent space filler. When writing or carving hieroglyphs, one of the objectives was to fill the space allotted to your writing as elegantly as possible. When making a decorative item or a piece of jewellery, a small sign with religious significance is perfect for filling gaps in the design. The enclosed ring has other meanings. When something is surrounded by this boundary, it's cut off from the rest of the world, set apart, made special. This hieroglyph, the tail end of a cartouche, is found in words that have to do with boundaries and division. The king of Egypt is not quite the same as you or I, and in this marvellous wall painting we can see that while the surrounding panel is painted in lustrous gold, within the cartouche is serene, even stark, white. The white appears to be a wash over the bare stone before other colours are applied, so maybe another colour was here in its place, but it doesn't look that way to me based on the state of the colours we can see. In either case, it is a separate enclosure, a special place both here and not here, in which the divine kings of the two lands dwell, among us but not quite of our kind. The cartouche as a frame for royal names is not as old as Hortawi. In fact, it was not until Senefru, a pharaoh in the 4th dynasty, that the cartouche came into consistent use. The serech, this enclosure designed to resemble a palace facade, predates it by a few centuries, and saw use thereafter, protecting the king's so-called Horus name. The cartouche protected pharaonic names until after the end of the Age of Pharaohs. When the Roman emperors were depicted in pharaonic guise, their names enjoyed the same protection as the hundred generations of monarchs that preceded them. Here is Emperor Trajan, his name rendered in hieroglyphs. The very title of Caesar is also written in hieroglyphs. What was Caesar, after all, if not a regnal name? Here, the Hellenized version, Kaisaros, is rendered phonetically. 
There was another interesting use of the cartouche. You or I wouldn't write our names in cartouches, and the only time the names of the gods appeared within them was when they formed part of a pharaoh's name, Amenhotep, Thutmose, and Ramesses, for example. But during the strange religious turmoil brought about by Amenhotep IV, who changed his given name to Akhenaten, a curious exception occurred. Here, we see the physical embodiment of the sun, Aten, referred to as the sun who is Horus upon the two horizons, rejoicing in the horizon, and in his name Shu, which is the Aten. It's a kingly name, protected by a kingly cartouche. Interpretations of this strange choice vary, between it being a declaration that Akhenaten, whose name after all was the one meant to be placed into the cartouche, was in fact the living god Aten, others interpret in the precise opposite way, as a gesture of humility. This is the king of Egypt saying, no, I am a mortal man, the true king is the Aten, and I am his subject as much as you are mine. We see beneath these Aten cartouches here the smaller ones of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, here called Neferheperere. What we make of this I'm not sure yet, but I will come back to this in a future video because the idea of Akhenaten is such a mixed one in the modern consciousness. So there, the cartouche. A protection, yes, but also a mark of difference, and a statement that the names within will endure for all eternity. I would say, given that we're learning about these men and women, in some cases 5,000 plus years after they lived, the cartouches aren't doing a bad job. I meant what I said about doing a video about Akhenaten and his relationship with his god. In fact, that's a response video, so I'm making sure I dot all the T's and cross all the I's before I present it. As always, get in the comments if you have questions or ideas for other areas I can explore in the world of Egyptology. But until next week, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.